Hello again, everyone. Nathan Lawrence here for Fire in the Hole. And I've got another message that's uh, like fire shut up in my bones that needs to get out. Now, the term fire shut up in my bones is from Jeremiah the prophet on several occasions in that wonderful book. The prophet of Elohim talked about the word of Elohim being like fire shut up in his bones. And I'm not here to make any comparisons between Eli um, Jeremiah and myself. Um, that would be very, very overreaching, very pretentious, and very arrogant. I don't claim to be a prophet, um, and I don't claim to be even remotely on a par with Jeremiah or any other prophet or any other major biblical figure. I simply use that term like fire shut up in my bones, again, not to be pretentious, not to assume or ascribe to myself anything that doesn't belong. But we are living in times that require people to speak out, require people who know the word of Elohim, know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, to speak out. And I've been silent on my YouTube channel for better part of a year and a half. And as far as these kind of teachings go. And I said I wasn't going to make any more videos until Yah gave me words that literally burned. And I, I felt the unction and the anointing. And I'm not coming out here saying, God told me to say this and God told me to say that. Like a lot of the false or carnal prophets out there do, I, I'm and in the church and elsewhere. I'm just giving what I believe Yah has laid on my heart. And I'm a nobody. I don't claim to be anything other than having sat at the feet of Yeshua better part of 60 years studying his word for well over 50 years every single day. Make of that what you will. I'm just stating the facts, not bragging, just stating the facts. And we're walking in his Torah for a better part of that time. And I'm nobody. Don't take my word for it. You prove everything that I say against the word of Elohim. As I've said before, not against what your favorite teacher, preacher, pastor, seminary, Bible college, denomination, whoever, whatever, but against the word of Elohim, the Bible. It's time that Yah's people stop being biblically illiterate and feeding on the baby food that they've been getting, largely getting from their ear-tickling, money-grubbing pastors all across the land, all across the world. I'm not broad brushing. There are exceptions, but the vast majority fall into that category. And the Bible prophesies it. Yeshua prophesies it. We've talked about these things before. So you prove what I'm saying. You look in the scriptures and you prove what I'm saying. And 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 not just cherry pick a verse out here and there and say, oh. You know, shoot it at me like a, like a silver bullet. No, you find all the scriptures that speak about that, a subject. And then you see what it really says. It may mean you have to get some Bible help books, some dictionaries, some, some concordances. But the resources are out there. The Bible software programs. I use eSword. There's others <coughs> where you can do word searches. Very easily and dig things up. You just need a, a good Bible search program, maybe a Strong's Concordance and a few other Bible helps. I've done videos on that in the past, or at least one video some years ago. And uh, as you can see, I've got a whole shelf full of hundreds of books behind me that are all biblical in nature. And I do a lot of studies and research. And I don't know that everybody needs to go to that extreme. I mean, you can if you want. But anyway, the bottom line is you back up what I say. So... I'm here to expose Christian mythologies. This is Exposing Christian Mythologies, Part 2. I made a video a few days ago, Part 1, where I laid the foundation, where the Bible talks about false teachers 
and people talking to the saints, heaping up to themselves teachers with itching ears, picking teachers that accommodate themselves rather than line up with the word of Elohim. This is Paul was talking to Timothy about that. And in 2 Peter 2, it talks about in the end times, the last days, um, again, false teachers going out preaching for money who, who do not know the word and, and leading people, you know, destructive or damnable heresies. Yeshua talked about in Matthew 24, false teachers claiming to have the anointing and claiming to represent him, leading people astray. He said, because the love of many will grow cold, many will turn away from him in the end days because they do not know the word. They do not know the Bible. In Revel Revelation chapter 3, John the Revelator, Yeshua speaking, red letters in your Bible, talks about a lukewarm church. They think they are so great, but they're naked, naked, miserable, poor and blind. So I went through that last uh, number one, uh, laying the foundation. These are the times in which we're living. And it's time that we got real and got right with Yeshua the Messiah, who's coming back to judge the world and judge saints. And he's not coming back for a bride with spot and wrinkle. Okay. So, and let me just say this also. <clears throat> Before I get in, I'm going to start going down doctrines in the Christian church. And just for some of you people say, oh, he's just Christian bashing. No. I'm not bashing any Christians. I'm bashing what the doctrines of men by which the word of Elohim has been made of none effect. I'm bashing the doctrines of men by which the word of Elohim has been made of none effect. And there's a lot of them that have crept into the church. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, you name it over the last 1900 years. And if I flip this around, and you look at this set of books, 10 volumes, Anti-Nicene Church Fathers. Go read it for yourself. Starting the Church Fathers, all of their writings, uh, starting in about 110 AD, all the way up to the Council of Nicaea in 323 um, AD. All up there. Go read for yourself what they wrote, what they taught. And they taught a lot of good things. But they also taught a lot of damnable heresies because of their hatred for the Jews and the Jewish and the Hebraic roots of the Christian faith. Which has now become mainstream doctrines in the Christian church. And we're going to go over some of these things. So you, if you think I'm Christian bashing, no, I'm not bashing Christians. There's a lot of really good Christians out there. They're doing the best that they have with what they know, but they've been taught false stuff. It's time to come out of her, my people, come out of Babylon, that mixture of truth and error, good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Satan, the snake and the tree, uh, got people to, got the first people to, to believe in and get off of the word of Elohim and into sin. And Elohim is calling his people out of Babylon right now. Revelation 18, 4. That harlot horse system that's been fornicating with the world and bringing in traditions of men and pagan traditions like the Christmas tree and the Easter bunny into the Christian church and many others that we're going to go over. Um, now, out of all fairness, I'm going to make a video about the good things that are in the Christian church. That'll be coming down the line, so stay tuned. There's a lot of good things that they do teach that are correct or correct enough, enough to get people saved and on the right path and, you know, change lives for the better. So we're going to make a video on that also. I want to be objective here. And I'm also going to make a video, uh, most likely after that, exposing some of the things in the Hebrew Roots Messianic movement that are off. So, as I said in the previous video, <clears throat> I'm not on anybody's side. I'm not for anybody, and I'm not against anybody. I'm on the side of truth and righteousness as 
determined by the whole council of Yehovah's Elohim's word, the Holy Bible. And let me just say this in conclusion of the introduction here. I'm not taking people's money. I'm not money grubbing. I have nothing to sell. I don't have a mailing list. I don't have a following. I pastored a church for 18 years, but I retired from that a few years back. I have nobody following me, you know, like I'm some great somebody. I'm just a voice in the wilderness. And if my words, the words I'm giving, resonate with your spirit and line up with the word, then listen. If not, shut me off and go your merry way. It's that simple. Okay. Which doctrine of Christianity are we going to attack first? I'm not attacking people. I'm attacking the false belief system. Well, I'm not sure which one of these is the most important. <clears throat> so I'm just going to pick one out. The first few I'm going to talk about are up at the top. Let's talk about this concept of the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. As in the idea in the Christian church that the New Covenant replaced, annulled, and obliterated much of the truth of the Old Covenant. Now, there, the Bible contains covenants. It's where Yovah Elohim makes a legal agreement with his people. There's a lot of smaller covenants, like the, the Adamic covenant, the Noetic covenant, the Davidic covenant, but we're not going to focus on those right now. <clears throat> the main covenant that affects us is the covenant that he made with Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant that the church says was done away with. And a subsection of that is the Mosaic or Levitical or Sinaitic covenant that Yah made with his people at Mount Sinai, starting in chapter 19, chapter 20, and formulated in chapter 24 of Exodus. That's commonly referred to as the Mosaic or the Sinaitic, as in Mount Sinai covenant. And that was a subsection of the Abrahamic covenant. And then you have with Yeshua, he introduced the new covenant or the renewed covenant. Either terms are, 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 are correct according to both the biblical Hebrew and the biblical Greek. And these, this new covenant, which the Old Testament refers to as the everlasting covenant, is where he would write his laws on the hearts of his people by his spirit, the pen of his ruach or the pen of his spirit. Jeremiah prophesied about that in Jeremiah 31, 31 and 33. Isaiah prophesied about this, and it, you find it throughout many, many scriptures in the, in the prophets. And Yeshua introduced the new covenant, or the renewed covenant, um, at Passover, the Last Supper or Passover, his Pesach meal that he took with his disciples before he went to the cross. He said, this is, you know, drink this cup. This is the cup of the new covenant. Eat this bread. This is the, you know, this is my body and the new covenant and all that. We're not going to get into the details. We're skimming over the waves here. So <clears throat> when a believer comes to faith in Yeshua, he's brought into a covenantal relationship with Elohim through Yeshua. And the Abrahamic covenant is still very relevant. It's the covenant of salvation by grace through faith. You think salvation by grace through faith is a concept of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 2? No! It goes back to the Abrahamic covenant because 
he had faith in Elohim. It was accounted to him for righteousness sake. And Paul makes that point in Romans chapter 4, showing that that is the covenant of salvation. So that old covenant is very relevant as a template and a pattern how to be saved. The Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> so this idea that the old covenant is done away with or whatever is bad. Bunk. Garbage. Crapola. False teaching. Doctrines from the pit of hell. And those of you that are teaching that, sit down, shut up, stop regurgitating the lies that you've learned in the offshoots of the Catholic Church and all of its harlot daughters, and go back and learn your Bible. I'm talking to pastors and Bible teachers who are you regurgitating and vomiting the garbage, the anti-biblical garbage that you've learned from those people that regurgitated, from those people that regurgitated, going back to these anti-Nicene church fathers. Anti, as in A-N-T-E, not A-N-T-I. They preceded the Council of Nicaea, who were Jew, many of them were Jew haters. Go read. Go read Ignatius, especially Irenaeus. Go read, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Was it Justin Martyr who wrote, you know, the letters to Trifo? Yeah, and many others. They were virulent anti-Semites, and they hated the law and Moses. Go, go learn and study about uh, Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N, the heretic, whose false doctrines made it into the, into the Christian church. Do your homework. Stop regurgitating what you learned in Bible College 101 Kindergarten. Ugh. Okay, so the new, the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of salvation. Again, Paul makes it very clear. It's the template of the pattern. The Mosaic covenant that came along was specifically tailor fit. It was a subsection of the Abrahamic covenant <clears throat> to, it was the constitu literally the constitution of, for the children of Israel on how to have a nation and how to ha live a holy life. And, you know, it was a, a, a body of laws, a judicial system, a legal system. And it contained many aspects of how to walk out the Abrahamic covenant. Now that you are saved through the Abrahamic covenant, through the template of salvation found there, now how do we walk? This is how you walk. The children of Israel technically got saved when the when the when the they put the blood of the lamb on the door of their houses, that's a picture of the Yeshua, and they slaughtered the lamb on Passover night, and that's a picture of Yeshua at the cross. And and then they went to the Red Sea, picture of baptism for the remission of sins, and they came to Mount Sinai where Yah gave him his word. This is the way, now that you're saved, this is how you walk in it. This is how you walk in relationship with me and your fellow man. It's really that simple. But as you know, they failed to obey his commandments. So the prophets in the Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others predicted that Yeshua, that, that Elohim would send his son, the Messiah, and, he, and then he would send his Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and Yah would write his laws on their hearts. And that would be a new covenant, an everlasting covenant. That would be the marriage covenant between Elohim between Yeshua, Yehovah Yeshua, and his people. And Paul makes reference, I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but if you go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, starting in about verse 11, he talks about to the Gentiles there in the church of Ephesus, you know, you were once without God and without hope. Gentiles. He's, that's how he defines, spiritually dis, defines Gentiles. Without God, without Elohim, and without hope. But, and you were outside the covenants of promise. Not just the new covenant, but the previous covenants too. The Abrahamic and the, and the Mosaic. You were outside the covenants, plural of promise. Guys, when we come to Yeshua, but now, but now you have been grafted in, quoting Paul in Romans 11, you've been grafted into the olive tree of Israel, and now back to Ephesians chapter 2, you are part of the nation, the commonwealth of Israel. You are no longer Gentile, but you're part of Israel. You're grafted in, and now 
The two, Jews and non-Jews, have become one. The one new man in Yeshua. Go read it. Ephesians 2, 11 through 19. All through Yeshua. So these covenants are relevant to us. There's, it's not that the new covenant obliterated the old covenant. It's that one covenant builds upon another. Now, with regard to the Mosaic Covenant, do we still do the sacrificial system and the, and the Levitical priesthood system? No, because those were signs, prophetic signs or shadows that pointed to Yeshua the Messiah. They never were the full intent of the Torah. They, like I've said before, they were like the sign along the road that said, Chicago or New York or Portland or Los Angeles or whatever, 10 miles away or 15 or 100 or 500 miles away. They were the signs. They were not the city or the destination itself. That's why when Yeshua came along and he said, think not that I have come to destroy the Torah, to undo it, to obliterate. I came to fulfill it, to bring it into its plurao, into its fullness. And that's what the writer of the epistle of Hebrews is telling us. That Yeshua, all this stuff pointed to him. And he's the ultimate reality of what those things in the Torah were pointing to. And I'm talking specifically about the Levitical priesthood system, the tabernacle or temple system, the sacrificial system. I'm not talking about the rest of the Torah. The rest of the Torah. Thou shalt not murder, steal, commit adultery, honor your parents, don't worship idols, the Sabbath, Biblical feasts, dietary laws, don't go to witches, don't, don't whore around, don't go to, uh, you know, sacrifice your children to, to, to the altars of Baal and Moloch and all those guys. You know, uh, take care of your animals, put fences around things, uh, keep the feast days, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. Those were laws of right living. Those were laws of how to love your neighbor as yourself and Elohim with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And those laws are still applicable. Now, we can take this one step further. So we've been grafted into all of that. And we can take this one step further. You can go and read in uh, Hebrews 8 and other places in Hebrews. And I've done videos on this. I, I'm not going to go through it now. But we are actually in the transition period between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, we, if we know Yeshua, we have been brought into the new covenant. But, it says that the old covenant there in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 8, is passing away. And he is bringing us into a new covenant. It's a process. And there are different people at different places in that process. And when Yeshua comes back, he's going to finalize that covenant when he drinks the fourth cup of the wine that he didn't drink at his Passover. And that's the second cup of the wedding ceremony in the traditional Jewish wedding, the Nisuin, the, 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 the cup of, of, of the marriage covenant. <clears throat> and that's when he, right now we're betrothed to the saints. The true saints are betrothed to Yeshua as his bride. But then we will be his wife, if you will. And that will be the marriage supper of the Lamb when he comes back. And that happens during the Feast of Tabernacles. So this idea that the Old Covenant came along and nullified the, um, the New Covenant came along and nullified the Old Covenant is a lie from the pit of hell. It's not something even that Yeshua or, or the apostles taught. And so you need to wrap your brain around that. And that comes as a newsflash to a lot of people. But yeah, we are under the New Covenant, but it doesn't nullify anything in the Old Covenant. Because truth does not change. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Yehovah continues his truth. It's a straight line. It's, it's a plumb line. It's not, he's not a respecter of persons and has one set of standards of righteousness for one group of people. And another set of standards of righteousness for another person. One standard of how to be saved for one group of people that lived thousands of years ago, and another one for another group of people that leave, lived thousands of years later. No, the truth of the Bible is the same forever. He does not change. His truth remains the same. So those covenants are still applicable to us, even though 
we're in the new covenant, but the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of salvation and the covenant of how to walk now that you're saved are still applicable. The big difference is that now we have the spirit that's circumcised our heart, transformed us and written his laws in our hearts so that we can actually do them by his mercy and his grace. So that's the first Christian mythology we wanted to debunk. The idea, the false idea, that the new covenant replaces and obliterates and annuls and abrogates the truths of the old covenant. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is this concept of law versus grace. Uh, another false concept. So, with the idea of law, you have the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, in, this is the, how the church presents it, and now we're living under grace. What does that really mean? Well, let me just say that this concept was originated by Marcion of Sinope, S-I-N-O-P-E. You can go look it up and read about him. He was a heretic that had great influence in the early church, starting in the, I don't know, around the middle, around 150 AD, plus or minus. Eventually, the, Christ, uh, the, the proto-Catholic church uh, kicked him out after he had, he was very wealthy, and he went around the area of the Mediterranean Sea and, 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 and you know, that part of the Roman Empire and influenced a lot of people with this idea that law versus grace, that the God of the Old Testament was some harsh, mean, draconian, um, you know, um, Elohim God that was against us and was, was, was judgmental and his laws were awful. <clears throat> and then the God of the New Testament is a God of love. That's Jesus. And he is a God of grace and mercy. And, and we follow him, not that awful Old Testament God, you know, that the Jews were under bondage to and all this. That's where the concept came up, came from, was from this guy. And needless to say, most of you have caught in flavors of that in the various churches. I pastored for many, many years. People that had come out of the Christian church, you know, out of the traditional Christian church. And many times I asked them when I'd be preaching, you know, did you, did you guys, is this what you were taught? And the hands would go up. Law was done away with. We don't need anymore. That's that awful law under the old God of the Old Testament, the, the Father. Now, as I said, the church, the, the, what became the Catholic Church, eventually the Christian church of that century, eventually kicked him out as a heretic. But they did not kick Martian, not Martian, but Martian, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. They did not excommunicate him because of this teaching. They excommunicated him because he, did, he taught that Yeshua was not the son of Elohim and was not deity. That he was a phantom. He mixed um, Greek Gnosticism with, this, with the concept of the deity of Yeshua. And he came up with a weird idea. Um, he called him the uh, demi Urge, it looks like demi urge, D E M I U R G E in Greek. That would be, uh, according to Greek, would be demi urge. And he, he taught a false concept. So he denied the deity of Yeshua. So that's why the Christian church kicked him out. But they kept this other idea that he had taught. And, and, and it has now part of the historic Christian faith. Well, let me just say this about grace versus law or law versus grace. If these two things are antithetical, then why is grace mentioned two times more frequently in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament? Why does it say that Noah found grace in the eyes of Elohim? It's the Hebrew word, I believe, is shen, C-H-E-N, or I mean, chen, actually, in Hebrew. And um, why is it the concept of grace, and you can also go read about it in the 13 attributes of Jehovah's grace uh, that he had upon the children of Israel in Exodus 32 when they sinned at the golden calf. And it talks about here that he is gracious. So you guys need to get back and study your Bible. Find out what it really says. says. And I'm going to keep hammering this point home. Instead of just regurgitating the crapola 
so much of the crap, it's not all bad, but that stuff that does not line up with your with with the Bible, you need to stop regurgitating it. Um, you know, like a bunch of vomit from your from your pastors and your teachers and your books that you're reading that spout this stuff. It says here in Revel in in um, uh, Exodus thirty three. That he talks about verse 12. We found grace in my sight. Uh, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way. You know, and I may find grace in your sight. Verse 13. Uh, verse 16. For then we will know that your people have found grace in your sight. 17. For I have found grace in your sight. Uh, verse 19. This is just all in one chapter. Acts 33. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is Jehovah speaking. And then we go over here and we read about the uh, verse chapter 34 of Exodus. The uh, 13 attributes of Jehovah's mercy or his grace. Jehovah Elohim is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, by mean, no means cleaning, uh, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting iniquities, and so forth and so on. So that was after the golden calf incident. And then you go and you read in the Psalms. I mean, grace is all over the place. So this idea that grace is only in the New Testament, another life from the pit of hell to set the Bible against itself, to set the Old Testament against itself, and it's against the New Testament, and pit one against the other. And then, you know, this bad law and this good grace. If you look up the word grace, if you look up the word grace and you study it out in, in, in the New Testament, but you look up the, the Greek word grace, it's the Greek word kalis. It's where we get the word charismatic. It means gift <coughs> or, or some call it grace gifts or spiritual gifts. But you will find, if you do a deep study of that word, that it means not only uh, gifts from heaven, but it also refers to divine enablement. In other words, with those gifts that Yah gives, spiritual gifts that he gives to believers, he also gives them the ability to execute them and to live up to his word. So it's not just, oh, I'm under the grace of Elohim, and now I can go do whatever I want. That's turning the grace of Elohim into license or lasciviousness to quote the King James and license to sin license to go against the word and that goes part and parcel with the idea that the law has been done away with well if the law has been done away with then I guess it's all right to commit adultery to fornicate to get drunk to take drugs to lie to steal to cheat to worship idols to break the seventh day sabbath to eat unclean foods like pork and shellfish, to follow heathen practices, and on and on, have sex with animals, be a homosexual, go to visit witches and sorcerers, and, and conduct in necromancy and seances, and the list goes on and on. Oh, oh, no, I don't mean that, says your pastor. We just want to follow the moral law. I discussed that in a, a previous video. There is no such thing as the moral law. That's a man-made delineation, the moral law versus the ceremonial law. You do not find that concept in the scriptures. There is the law of Elohim, which are the precepts, the truth, the concepts, the teachings of Elohim, and then there's sin. But you can't divide things in the Bible that are indivisible, that are, cannot be divided. That's, those are doctrines of men by which the word of Elohim has been made of none effect. By, and they've cherry-picked scriptures out of context, out of some of Paul's writings, and, and, and maybe the writer of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. And, and they have twisted those scriptures to make them say what they don't say. So the idea that law and grace are antithetical is nothing could be further from the truth. They are two sides of the same coin. Now, in the Old Testament, in the uh, or the Tanakh, in the Torah, there are 613 laws. Thank God we're not under that. Thank God we don't have to follow those anymore, even though 
Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Oh, well, that's an exception. Thou shalt not have sex with them. Well, that's an exception. Uh, tithing. Well, that's an exception, even though that was part of the Levitical system. Got to keep that one. Oh, yeah, got to keep the church and the pastors fat and happy in the denomination so the Catholic Church can build its cathedrals and own more real estate in New York City than anybody else and that you can build your big monuments, your you know, your mega churches and, 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 and you can buy your jets and your planes and your mansions and whatever, 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 whatever. You know the story. Oh, man, this is nauseating. The wickedness and the twisting of the word of Elohim and how off scripture these guys are. They don't follow the example of Yeshua. They twist his word to their own ungodly, unjust, evil gain of money and power. And don't forget the sex. A lot of them are a bunch of sexual perverts on top of it all. Look how many have been revealed in the last few years with the internet and the media and everything. Where was I? <laughs> I get lost. But that's righteous indignation, and that's the fire shut up in my bones. May those who have ears to hear, hear, and those who have eyes to see, see and repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and Yeshua is coming back, and blessed are those that have the white and righteous garments of righteousness, the white robes of righteousness on, on their bodies. They're not naked and blind and deaf like the Laodicean churches church was in um, Revelation chapter 3. But they're wearing the white robes of righteousness, not only the imputed righteousness of Yeshua, but also the righteousness which the book of Revelation in chapter 19 says are the righteous deeds of the saints. Yeah, your works. Your works. I'm not saying you're saved by your works. Nobody can do enough works to be saved or good enough to be saved. But I'm saying your deeds and your works will determine your level of, and position and level of rewards in the kingdom of Elohim. Whether you're the least or the greatest, according to Matthew 5.19. Go read it. Matthew 5.19. Red letters in your Bible. So, grace and law are two sides of the same coin. You never heard that in your Sunday churches, did you? No, because they're teaching lies. Grace and, and law are two sides of the same coin. Grace forgives you of your past sins and, and then empowers you to go forward. Listen, this is a very important point. Grace forgives you, covers over unmerited pardon over your past sins through the shed blood of Yeshua and empowers you through the gifts of the Spirit and through His divine power. It empowers you now to go forward and sin no more. This is the way. Walk ye in it. It doesn't um, excuse a person to be able to go out and violate the Torah and go against what Scripture says because I'm saved. I got my get out of hell free card punched. Now I can do whatever I want. I just have to be a good person. But if I want to sleep around and get drunk and violate the Sabbath and work on Shabbat and, and do all these other things the law says do not do, and they're an abomination and a front and, and, and sin. Because my pastor said it was okay to eat pork and to, to, you know, do this and do that. Well, your pastor is teaching you damnable heresies to quote Second Peter 2, King James. That do not line up with the word and each of us will be judged. So grace and law are two sides of the same coin. They're beautiful. Working together. The law convicts us of sin, brings us to the cross, shows us what we need to repent of, how we have offended Elohim, how we've gone against his commandments, and why we brought the death penalty on ourselves, the wage of sin is death, why Yeshua had to go to the cross and die in our place, and why we need his sacrifice. That's what the Torah does. 
That's one aspect of what the Torah does. And then when we repent of our breaking his Torah, his commandments, his instructions in righteousness, his laws, his commandments, his word, his truth, then we are given his grace. It washes away our past sins, removes the guilt, the shame, and the death penalty thanks to Yeshua's death on the cross, taking it upon himself. And now the law that convicted us now shows us the straight and narrow path how to walk so that we don't go to the left or to the right, so that we stay on that straight and narrow path that leads to a right relationship with our fellow man and, and, our, and our Father in heaven through Yeshua the Messiah. He writes his laws in our hearts. So the, the law now is a guardrail. And on either side of the guardrail of the straight and narrow path is a ditch or a cliff. Guardrails are there to protect you from going off the edge of the road. And that's what the law does. It shows us how to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. So that we don't bring on the death penalty, we don't fall into sin, and end up in the same mess that we were before we got saved. Nailing his shoe to the cross again. And yes, we won't walk perfectly, we'll stumble along the way, but our heart intent is to serve him and love him and keep his commandments as as Yeshua said of those that love him and are his disciples in John 14, 15 and John 14, 21. And as Paul says in thir uh, uh, Romans 13, uh, 8 through 10, love is the fulfilling of the law. And it keeps us from sinning. Sin is a violation of the law, 1 John 3, 4. <coughs> and if we do sin, we confess our sin, as it says in 1 John 1, 9, and we you know, acknowledge it, and then he will he confess it, and he will um, uh, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So grace and law are not antithetical. You've been lied to. So um, hopefully that will lay that one to rest. Um, I've got a little bit of time left. Um, well, actually, I'm going to stop there. And the next one we're going to cover is the false concept, and we've already alluded to it. I want to lay the foundation first, but the fa false concept that the Torah, the law was done away with, nailed to the cross, fulfilled by Yeshua so we don't have to do it. He did it for us. I'm going to wait and tackle that one on the next video. The reason is because if I do it here, it's probably going to be equal to the full amount of time that I've used this time. And I think I've hopefully given you enough to think about with what we've covered so far so that, you know, hopefully you will think about what you've been doing, what you've heard, what you've, what you've heard from your pastors and your teachers, and you will begin to evaluate what they said against the word of Elohim and against the truth that I presented to you. And what I say truth, I'm saying truth with a capital T, divinely revealed truth. And you're going to accept it, you're going to reject it, or maybe you're going to think about it. But whatever you do, it's between you and Elohim. Forget about me. I'm just a vessel. I'm just a voice. I'm a nobody. But if my words line up with the word of Elohim, which they do, but you go prove it for yourself, be a good Berean, then... Go do the right thing. Go get yourself lined up with Elohim and you will be blessed. You will truly be blessed in this life and in the life to come.